Well, we're back into our study. Uh, we're in the second chapter of the epistle of James. Our last verse that we looked at was verse 17. Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. And Of course, um, James was making the point that if someone is truly born again, and they have a heart that has been quickened and regenerated, is that you will see works. You will see works of righteousness being performed because that individual is clothed in Yeshua's righteousness. Okay? Uh, I've made mention of before, right at the close of the last lesson, a woman goes ahead and she sits down with her husband and she says, guess what, honey, what is that? I'm pregnant. And they... they hold each other and they hold hands and they're and they're so happy and they're maybe even shedding a tear or two but after a few months she's not showing and after six months she's not showing well guess what you thought you were pregnant or someone told you you were pregnant and you really weren't because if a woman is pregnant then there's life inside and that life will grow and it will become evident James's point if someone is born again it will show. You will see those works of righteousness. All right, on to verse 18. But someone may well say, You have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without the works, and I will show you my faith by my works. Notice he says, But someone may well say. In other words, they, they know the proper religious vocabulary. Uh, they have their... I's dotted, they have their T's crossed, they know the answers to give. Someone may well say, you have faith, and I have works. And then James says, show me. Show me. James is stating that true faith is seen, not spoken. Okay? Uh, I, I can go ahead and pick up a pair of drumsticks and tell you that I can play the drums. And you look at me and you say, huh, well, prove it. There's a drum set over there. You've got the drumsticks. Go ahead and prove it. Well, now we'll see really quick whether I know how to play the drums or not. Listen to the Apostle Peter. 2 Peter chapter 1, beginning of verse 3. Well-known passage. Seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness, through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. For by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises, so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. Now for this very reason also, applying all diligence, in your faith supply moral excellence, and in your moral excellence, knowledge, and in your knowledge, self-control, and in your self-control, perseverance, and in your perseverance, godliness, and in your godliness, brotherly kindness, and in your brotherly kindness, love. For if these qualities are yours, and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Yeshua the Messiah. For he who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted, having forgotten his purification from his former sins. Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you. For as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. For in this way, the entrance into the king, eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Yeshua the Messiah, will be abundantly supplied to you. J, uh, Peter is in essence saying the very same thing in a different kind of way. If these things, for if these qualities are yours, if the, the, these kind of, of, of spiritual fruit, if they're showing on your tree, and are increasing, meaning you're actually growing in your faith, and you're producing more fruit. And then he tells you this, making your calling an election or choosing you, sure. Now, unless you have fallen into sin and you have backslidden, I, I, I pray none, nobody goes down that road. Unfortunately, I did. I'm not proud of it. But I came to faith at an early age and I 
I severely backslidden in my 20s. And I can tell you that when you're immersed in sin, you start to doubt your own salvation. And I was saved. But you, you look at yourself and, and you can come to tears because you think, why am, I, why am I behaving like this? Why am I using this kind of language? Why am I going to these places if I really belong to him? If I'm really truly saved, why am I doing this? And I was, I was honestly, I was scared. I was, there was a part of me that was scared. What happens if I die like this? I don't really know. And unless you're, unless you're down in that valley, and unless you're, you've really backslidden, you don't know that feeling. And I did. Tim Hegg writes, he said, True saving faith, itself being the gift of God's grace, is always accompanied by a life that is transformed more and more to live and act in a way that honors God and conforms to the very likeness of Yeshua himself. If someone is truly born again, it is going to be seen. And as that person grows through the months and the years, it's going to be more evident. Just like a woman that is pregnant, it's going to be evident. Verse 19, you believe that God is one. You do well. The demons also believe and shudder. You take somebody, and it's so unfortunate, I can't even begin to imagine how many times this has happened through the years. Somebody gets dragged down an aisle of a church, dragged down to the altar. Go ahead. All right, now. I want you to recite the sinner's prayer. You got it? Okay, good. All right. Say, uh, Dear Heavenly Father, Dear Heavenly Father, uh, uh, I, I, I ask you, Jesus, I ask you, Jesus, come into my heart. Come into my heart. I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner. You died for me. You died for me. You rose again. You rose again. Please wash me my sin. Please wash me my sin. In Jesus' name I pray. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right. Well, congratulations. Okay. You're saved now. All right. It's good to have you aboard. And we've got some paraphernalia for you. Here's a book. You can take it home and read. And Well, James is saying, guess what? The demons can do that. The sinner's prayer. The demons can do that. Matthew 8, verse 29. And they, the demons, cried out saying, What business do we have with each other, son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? The demons know who he is. They acknowledge Yeshua is the Son of God. So they know exactly who he is. Does that mean they're saved? <laughs> of course not. Guzik writes, The fallacy of faith without works is demonstrated by the demons, which have a dead faith in God. The demons believe in the sense that they acknowledge that God exists. But this kind of faith does nothing for the demons because it isn't real faith. And that is proved by the fact that it doesn't have works along with it. They acknowledge that he was the Son of God. Lucifer quoted Bible. So the fact that the words come out of your mouth mean absolutely nothing. I'm a Christian. Prove it. That's where James is going. You believe that God is one. You do well. <laughs> Pat yourself on the back. Because Orthodox Judaism, Orthodox Jews, they say the Shema, they sing the Shema every day. Every day, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Do they believe in Yeshua? Then they have denied God. He said, you deny me, you deny the Father. So even, even the demons know that there's only one God, the God of Israel. And James lets you know, and they shudder. They shudder. So the demons know of the triune Godhead, and they hate that triune Godhead. They hate it. Warren W. Wearsby says, But it is not a saving experience to believe in tremble. A person can be enlightened in his mind and even stirred in his heart and be lost forever. True saving faith involves something more, something that can be seen and recognized. A changed life. 
a changed life. I said in our last lesson, it's like getting hit with lightning. You will never be the same. When Yeshua commands the demons to leave a person, what do they do? They obey. So wait a minute. So they acknowledge that he's the Son of God, and he told them to leave a person, whether it was one demon or a number of them, and they obeyed him. What does that tell you? Are they believers? Of course not. So you have obedience in a moment of time. And that obedience, even for James, in a moment of time, means nothing. The devil quoted scripture, the demon said he's the son of God, and they obeyed Yeshua. And it means nothing. Obedience in one moment does not equate into obedience over a lifetime. Someone goes to church. Congratulations. Anybody can do that. Anybody. They, they, drop, they, they drop an envelope in the plate as it goes by. Congratulations. Anybody can do that. But is that individual living out the Word of God in their life day after day after day, week after week after week, month after month after month? Are you seeing it on a daily basis? Are you hearing it? Are you observing it? That's where James is going. Even the demons shudder. Verse 20. But are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, that faith without works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up Isaac, his son, on the altar? And now we are getting into the passage of Scripture that Martin Luther struggled with. Martin Luther said, because of what, of what was written in these verses right here, that this epistle could not possibly have been written by an apostle. And so therefore it doesn't belong in the canon. Now you've got to understand, he's looking at Catholicism. And what does Catholicism teach? A justification by works. Without question. Catholicism teaches you have no place. You have, there's no place for you in, the, in, in heaven unless you adhere to the sacraments. You must perform the sacrament. You must take in the flesh of Christ. You must drink in the blood of Christ. You must do these things. So now, James goes uh, into this avenue. He's bringing up Abraham, our father. So, meaning he's speaking to Jew and Gentile alike. If you're born again, Abraham is your spiritual father. Sarah is your spiritual mother. Got it. Abraham, our father. Romans 4, 16, Paul writes, he is the father of us all. Abraham. Again, Paul says in Galatians 3, 28 and 29, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free man. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Messiah Yeshua. And if you belong to Messiah, then you are Abraham's descendants, heirs according to the promise. So if you're born again, you and I, we have the privilege of calling Abraham our father. Was not Abraham our father justified by works? And you can understand... <laughs> where Luther got it wrong. That was Luther's rub. Justified by works. In other words, if you haven't really paid attention to what James has told you, up to this point in the letter, that phrase, justified by works, reeks of a works-based justification. And that is not what James is saying. What Luther failed to understand was what James was saying, meaning justified, the word justified in this context means in the sight of men, not in the sight of God. You're justified by works in the sight of men. I told you that I can play the drums. Just because I'm holding the, the drumsticks doesn't mean I can. So you go ahead and say, really? Prove it. Then I get on the drums and I can actually play. Guess what? I am now justified by my playing of the drums. I have shown you exactly that which I said I was, a drum player. Genesis 15, verse 6, Then he believed in the Lord, Abraham did, and he reckoned it to him as righteousness. 
So that's not a works-based salvation. Of course it's not. James is not suggesting that Abraham's works declared him to be righteous. James' entire epistle thus far is that a true believer will be recognized by their works. They're not declared to be righteous by their works. They are recognized by their works. That's where he's going. And so, yes, was not Abraham our father justified by works? Absolutely. The fact that Abraham offered up Isaac was proof that he believed in a resurrection. That was the proof. That's where James is going. In fact, the author of Hebrews says the same thing. Chapter 11, verses 17 through 19. By faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises was offering up his only begotten son. It was he to whom it was said, In Isaac your descendants shall be called. He considered that God is able to raise people even from the dead, from which he also received them back as a type. Abraham knew. Abraham understood. All the promises of the Abrahamic covenant are wrapped up in my boy. And God wants me to slay him. If God wants me to slay him, then he will resurrect him. Abraham trusted in the word of God. And that faith was exhibited by his works. By his works. Romans 10 verse 17. So faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of God. Titus 3 and verse 8. This is a trustworthy statement. And concerning these things, I want you to speak confidently, so that those who have believed God will be careful to engage in good deeds. Justified by works. There you have it. It's not a justification of works. You are justified by your works. In that people not only hear you saying that you're a believer, they can see it. And they see it on a daily basis, not just once a week. Verses 22 and 23. You see that faith was working with his works. And as a result of the works, faith was perfected. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, And Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. Tim Hegg writes, By faith the child of God desires to obey and honor him. And the more such works characterize the believer, the more he or she is able to obey the Lord. For the life of obedience creates spiritual strength, by which the flesh is more and more overcome, and submission to God becomes the common pattern. End quote. Very true. In other words, you're going to give in. The evidence of someone who is truly born again is as they mature, as time goes on, they're not going to give in to their flesh. They're going to obey the word of God. As Paul says, crucify the flesh. And they do so. He says in, a, uh, in, this, uh, in this passage, faith was perfected. Perfected, meaning bringing something to its goal. Bringing something to its goal. MacArthur writes, just as a fruit tree has not arrived at its goal, until it bears fruit. Faith has not reached its end until it demonstrates itself in a righteous life. Genuine faith, genuine faith, will grow stronger and stronger as we become obedient to God's word. Again, genuine faith, real faith, will grow stronger and stronger as we become obedient to God's word. Does the individual that claims to be a Christian daily obeying God's word? If the answer is no, that person is not saved. James says, and he, meaning Abraham, was called the friend of God. Which is certainly not uncommon in the scriptures. James is really pulling from two books. Isaiah as well as Second Chronicles. In Isaiah chapter 41... Verses 8 and 9, God says, But you, Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, descendant of Abraham, my friend, you whom I have taken from the ends of the earth and called from its remotest parts and said to you, you are my servant, I have chosen you and not rejected you. So God himself, 
in Isaiah chapter 41 says, Abraham was my friend. My friend. That is reiterated in Second Chronicles chapter 20, verse 7. Did you not, O our God, drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and give it to the descendants of Abraham, your friend, forever? So James is pulling from those two passages and, re and reminding us that Abraham, who was justified by his works when he offered up Isaac, was a friend of God. Continuing, verse 24, You see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. Man, you can... <laughs> and if you just take that... If you just take that sentence, <laughs> if you had not read... James chapter 1 and chapter 2, the verse 23 verses of chapter 2. And you just yanked out verse 24. I can understand where anybody would say, this, this letter can't be in the Bible. You see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone? It sounds like, well, like I have to have faith and, and my works are added into it in order to keep that, to keep my salvation or to attain that salvation. And that's not what James is saying. Tim Hegg writes, God looks at the heart and knows those who stand justified, declared righteous by faith in Yeshua. Man sees one's works and only works of righteousness are the inevitable fruit of faith. So, again, someone comes to you and says, I'm a Christian. I'm a believer. The fact of the matter is, you're going to say, and you should say, well, prove it. Where are your works? But God knows if that person is telling the truth because he knows who belongs to him. You and I don't because we can't see the heart. All we can see is someone's life. Is their life patterned after Yeshua? Yes or no? Verses 25 and 26, our final two verses. In the same way, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. I mean, you want to talk about a stark contrast. <laughs> Rahab the harlot. The, a stark contrast in the transformation of one's life. I said earlier in this lesson, when someone gets hit by lightning, they're never the same. Rahab was never the same. As we tell the story once again from Joshua chapter 2, beginning of verse 8, now before they lay down, and listen to her words, listen to Rahab's words, now before they lay down, she came up to them on the, on the roof and said to the men, Listen, I know that the Lord has given you the land, and that the terror of you has fallen on us, and that all the inhabitants of the land have melted away before you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Sihon and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. When we heard it, our hearts melted, and no courage remained in any man any longer because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God, in heaven above and on earth beneath. <laughs> That's a mic drop. That is, that is like, Ruth telling Naomi, where you go, I will go. Your people are my people. Your God is my God. That is Rahab. That is what Rahab said. For the Lord your God, Yohei he is God. <laughs> there is no other word. There is no other God. So here you have, James is drawing upon an example. First he went with Abraham as an example, justified by works. We see what Abraham did. His faith was real. But now we're talking about a prostitute. A prostitute whose life was transformed and she knew if she were caught, she would be executed. She knew. Hebrews 11, verse 31, the author writes, By faith Rahab the harlot did not perish along with those who were disobedient after she had welcomed the spies in peace. So now we know, we know how the Lord blessed her for uh, abandoning her, her uh, 
wicked lifestyle and accepting the Lord and becoming a believer. And she goes on and he blesses her by uh, uh, bringing a godly man into her life. And she marries Solomon. And of course you have Obed and then you have Jesse. And then of course that we have King David. And the lineage of King David of course leads all the way to Yeshua. So Yeshua has got some interesting characters in his lineage, does he not? He's got a prostitute, he's got a Moabite, um, he's got a, a, a former king who committed adultery as well as murder. I mean, he's got some interesting characters in his lineage, in his line, uh, genealogy, in his lineage. But true saving faith, true saving faith is not just for one ethnicity also, you must know. It's not just for the Jewish people, it's not just for the Hebrews, Gentiles as well. Rahab was not Hebrew, and neither was Ruth. For just as the body without the spirit is dead, James writes, so also faith without works is dead. 2 Corinthians 13 verse 5, test yourself to see if you are in the faith, examine yourselves. Examine yourselves. James comes to his final point. If there is a body, a human body, and it's not breathing, the organs have shut down. There's no brain activity. The spirit is then gone. It is dead. It's dead. There's no evidence. There's no evidence of life. Then the body is dead. Where is the evidence of that individual who is saying they're a Christian? Where is the evidence of that? John Calvin writes, Man is not justified by faith alone. That is, by a bare and empty knowledge of God. He is justified by works. That is, his righteousness is known and proved by its fruits. So salvation is, is by grace through faith, without question. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. But now that you are saved and born again, you will produce fruit. You, there will be works. There will be works of righteousness. There has to be, if there's life there. Ephesians 2, verses 1 and 2, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of dis disobedience. You formerly walked in that way. You formerly behaved like an unbeliever. Not anymore. Not anymore. Colossians 2, verses 13 and 14. When you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our transgressions, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. It is a saving faith, and it is a real faith. It's not a religion. In fact, James, even uh, verses ago, he says that religion is useless. It's worthless. Tony Evans writes, The faith of a believer can atrophy, and we can become orthodox corpses unless our faith is put to work. Many of us have spiritual life, yet we're spiritually sick. We attend church to hear what the great physician has to say and leave feeling good about his prescription. We remain spiritually unhealthy, though because we don't swallow the medicine. Once we hear God's word, we must act on it to be transformed by it. I know he's mentioned in previous, less, in previous sermons where he says, there are some of you sitting in the crowd. You will forget this sermon by the time you get to the door of your car. It means nothing. You're going through the motions. You're here. You're sitting in a seat. You're listening to my voice. And it mean, this sermon means nothing. Nothing. It makes no change in you. Warren W. Wearsby writes, James chapter 2 emphasizes that the mature Christian practices the truth. 
He does not merely hold to ancient doctrines. He practices those doctrines in his everyday life. His faith is not the dead faith of the intellectuals or the demonic faith of the fallen spirits. It is the dynamic faith of men like Abraham and women like Rahab, faith that changes a life and goes to work for God. Well, there you have it. We've completed chapter two. And my final words uh, before we uh, close out the, the lesson. Uh, it, it, once again, I, I, I love the, the analogy of fruit trees. You come up to a fruit tree... And someone tells you, okay, that's an apple tree. Let's say that's an apple tree. Now, you don't see any apples on it. And it doesn't really matter at that point. Now, if you do see apples, that's great. But you don't see any apples on it. Are you going to know for certain that's an apple tree? Of course not. You have no idea. You won't have any idea in the first 12 seconds. You won't have an idea in the first 12 minutes. And you won't probably even have any kind of idea in the first 12 hours. So then you come back 12 days later. And you still don't see apples on it. Then you come back 12 weeks later. And you still don't see apples on it. Now 12 months have passed. And there's still no apples? That is not an apple tree. Now, maybe the apple tree, maybe it believes it's an apple tree. Or someone told you it's an apple tree that is not an apple tree because apple trees produce apples and that's it or dare I say all of a sudden within the 12 month period you're keeping an eye on that on that supposed apple tree and guess what that's not an apple that's an orange it's a different kind of fruit well it's not an apple tree it's an orange tree you just call it like you see it that's where James is going just because somebody tells you they're a Christian, just because somebody says they're born again, or they have the right vocabulary, they have, they have all the answers, they can say the right words, they even go to church every Sunday, or they go to shul every Shabbat. James is saying, that means nothing. It means nothing. Because the devil can quote scripture, the demons know that Yeshua is the Son of God, and the demons actually obey Yeshua. What is the evidence over a year, over five years, over ten years? Do you see fruit on that tree? And if you don't, then that person is not born again. We've now completed chapter number two, and when we get back together again, we'll start in on the third chapter.